You've written what I think can only be described as a furious article this morning, accusing rich Western nations of sitting on their hands while Africa is ravaged by COVID. What's made you so cross? Look, look 70% of the West has been vaccinated. Only 2% in Africa and actually in all the other low-income countries of the world. So 98% are unprotected. It's bad for them, it's bad for us, because the disease will come back to haunt us from Africa and hurt even the fully vaccinated here with new variants. But what I'm showing this morning is that there are hundreds of millions of unused vaccines that are either stored or on, are on order for delivery to Europe and America, including the United Kingdom. 300 million by the end of this month, 500 million by the end of October, a billion by the end of December, these vaccines could save thousands of lives in Africa. And you've talked about very important issues this morning, and they are important, but no issue we're talking about could save more lives than a policy decision by the richest countries that these surplus, unused, stockpiled stocks could actually go to the poorest countries who desperately need them to protect even the nurses and their health workers who remain unvaccinated against this disease. With the best will in the world, though, um, the realist might say we can't actually be sure, and it's not their fault, but we can't actually be sure that the African nations can distribute those millions of vaccines. It's difficult and they don't have the networks, they don't have the capabilities. And that is, is the problem just one of will or is it one of capability? Well, that's not what the Africans tell me. I've talked to many African leaders in the last few days and they're desperate to get the vaccines and they can't get hold of them. And in fact, for a few weeks, Europe has been raiding Africa for vaccines and taking them for, from a production facility in South Africa to Europe. So we are doing the worst possible thing when it comes to making the world safer against COVID. If we leave these people unprotected, if it spreads uninhibited, it will come back to us. But it's absolutely clear to me that we not only have the stocks in the West that would enable us to vaccinate the over 12s, uh, to do the boosters, uh, but also to be able to send these stocks that are on order or in warehouses across to the countries that need them most. It's really a failure of international coordination. Uh, the vaccines are increasingly there. One and a half billion produced every month, two billion by January. Uh, record supplies are going to be available, but the distribution is all wrong. And we are hoarding and stockpiling when we should actually be delivering them to the people who need them, knowing that if we need more vaccines, we have another bout that we need to deal with. We can get vaccines very quickly. You were at the centre of the last uh, time we had the need, this kind of need for a concerted global push on something specific. And I'm now referring to the financial crisis back in 2008. Um, if you were still in office, what would you be saying to your G7 colleagues? I mean, what, what physically do they have to do? They've got to call a summit, an emergency summit, in the next two weeks. They've got to deal with this urgent problem that if left unaddressed, thousands of people are at risk of dying. When I dealt with the G20 in 2009, I realised one thing. You can't rely on the IMF and the World Bank and the UN, good as they are, you cannot rely on them. Only the leaders can make these decisions. Only the leaders who control the allocation of vaccines in their own countries can decide to transfer them to other countries or to transfer the options for them. So it's really up to Joe Biden, Boris Johnson, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, Mr. Macron in France. These are the leaders that can, by getting together, make a decision. Everybody can contribute. The money can be made available. It's a question of getting the vaccines into the right arms in the right place as quickly as possible. And we are talking about tens of thousands of lives that are at risk now if we do nothing about this. From your experience, uh Mrs. Brown, uh, th th there is something really profoundly puzzling and disturbing about this. I mean, we have a vast international machinery, the UN, the WHO, the IMF, plus the G7, G7 summit. And something as simple as moving vaccines from Europe to, let's say, South Africa or West Africa should have been sorted out by now. Isn't this an indictment, if you like, of the international multilateral system about which you know, nobody, everybody never stops boasting uh, about how important yeah. and useful this cooperation is. 
Yet multilateral cooperation is not working here. They had a chance in June at the G7 to allocate uh, the uh, 11 billion vaccines that were needed to make sure we had a plan to get them to those where the urgency was greatest. Uh, but they failed to do this in June. Now they've got another chance. They can meet on the margins of the United Nations and get it done. And this is really a test of multilateral cooperation. If you can't distribute the vaccines equitably when the vaccines are available, what else will we fail to do if we can't do this? Uh, and so I believe that in the next two weeks, a decision will have to be made. I'm pressing for this meeting to take place, and so are others. You'll find African leaders will be demanding it too. Faith and church leaders know that this vaccine divide between vaccine rich and vaccine poor is really a terrible stain. It's a moral failure on the part of the whole of the world. And of course, it's in everybody's interest that people are vaccinated in every continent, because clearly nobody is safe until everybody is safe. This is a second example of something that I think has a much deeper meaning. Um, and I'm first example being the exit from Afghanistan, that the era of liberal interventionism uh, by the West led by America is over, isn't it? It feels like actually there isn't a leader anymore and that all of the things that brought uh, relief to Kosovo, Sierra Leone and so on, no longer obtain. Is that where we are in the world right now? Well, I think what President Biden done is said, America no longer wants to be the world's policeman. But look, the America and the richer nations have got to be the world's problem solver. You may not want to intervene militarily, but if you've got the vaccines or if you've got the wealth and you know there's an urgency to solve problems of poverty or problems of ill health or problems of illiteracy, then you've got to do something about it. And I think what we're really talking about is how we can intervene in a way that is purposeful, in a way that gets results, in a way that is not counterproductive. And one signal of that would be, of course, taking action on vaccines. And I hope that can happen very soon. So, so yes, if the, world, if the world, as I said, was one country, it would be declared or designated a failed state. But there is scope to do something about it. In this instance, it requires about four people to get round the table and to make a decision. And once they make that decision, we can save thousands of lives. So I, I, it's a test of international cooperation. Is there the will to do things or are we to retreat into vaccine nationalism and eventually still to America first, Britain first, China first, India first and so on. That is not the way that the world is going to solve problems of climate change, solve problems of financial instability, solve problems obviously of pandemics. It's, uh, I mean, something has shifted though, hasn't it? Um, uh, if I can put it in perhaps not too trivial a way, if an alien uh, were to land on the planet uh, now, uh, in previous days, you would have said, and the alien said, take me to your leader. In previous days, we would have given him the address uh, or her the address of the White House, wouldn't we? Um, that's not going to happen today. These things don't happen just by themselves. They have to be led. And I suppose what I'm really asking from your experience, your background, where is that leadership going to come from? You know, that's the question that Ronald Reagan asked Mikhail Gorbachev. If an asteroid arrived on the planet, would you help us? And Gorbachev said yes, and Reagan said me too. And it's cooperation that matters, so perhaps it's not one leader. It's the recognition that we are a multilateral world. America used to act multilaterally in a unipolar age. It seems to act unilaterally in a multipolar age, at least under President Trump. What we've got to realize is that these problems can be solved only by cooperation. In a multipolar world, you've got to get people around the table. We did that in 2009 to solve or to try to solve the financial crisis. We've got a vaccine crisis. We've got a health crisis. We are going to see in the next few weeks that we've got a climate change crisis. Now, no one country can solve that. They've got to find a way of working together. And I hope that for the sake of the planet, uh, we can find a way of getting the different leaders of different countries who are practicing perhaps nationalistic policies at the moment. They've got to find a way of showing that cooperation is the only way forward. OK, I know that uh, you're not uh, directly involved in domestic politics anymore, but um, it, I'd look a bit silly if I didn't ask you about the uh, current financial and economic uh, situation facing this country. Um, somebody's going to have to pay. 
for the trillions that we've committed to dealing with the pandemic. And we've got the social care uh, thing coming down the track. And it's been there since you were uh, Chancellor. Um, two questions, really. Well, first question. Where would you be looking for the money? Would you support a rise in the national insurance tax? And would you support the TUC's proposal for uh, a wealth tax? Well, we, we did uh, the national insurance rise in 2002 3 and that paid for the health service to expand massively. I think 100,000 more nurses and 30,000 more doctors. I always said you'd have to come back to this 10 years on because we've got rising population pressures, rising elderly, technology is costing more, and of course, the pandemic. Uh, so you've got to look at how you can finance this. First out of growth, we need to get back to growth. The only way of reducing debt and deficits is through growth. And secondly, looking at the fair allocation of resources. The problem I see at the moment is we've got a government divided between the small state conservatives who want to cut taxes and cut spending, and the One Nation Conservatives who understand they've got to do something about it. And I suspect that that division goes right from top to bottom of the Conservative Party, between north and south, between rural and urban areas, between suburbs uh, and the shires. And they've got to sort out these divisions within the party to come to a solution because the health service has got to be funded and we've got to get out of this pandemic by making sure that children, for example, are not in poverty and that's why the cut in universal credit uh, in a few weeks' time is completely unacceptable. It puts six million families further into poverty. So the government's got to resolve this conflict, which didn't exist uh, 20 years ago within our government, but clearly exists in this government between small state conservatives and one nation conservatives. And I fear that that rents asunder the whole Conservative Party. But what if, um, if it were up to you now, would you support a rise in national insurance? You've done it before. Would you say national, it's the right thing to do now? Is, see, th th this is a bit different. You've got social care now, and you've got to provide a long-term solution to social care. So you're looking at a social solution not just for a year or two, but for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And therefore, national insurance must be one of the uh, issues for consideration. But you've got to be thinking, how can we pay for this over the long term? Uh, because this elderly uh, issue for providing social care is something that is going to grow. It's going to become more intensified over the next few years. And therefore, the measures that you take have got to be looked at very carefully. And they've got to be based on what you can afford and what you're prepared to do and ask people to do over the long term. So I'd be looking at a number of options.